Good morning. Uh, so we're gonna, we, you know, we've had a few talks already on um, compact object mergers. I think earlier in the week you had some talks. We talked a little bit about our process nucleosynthesis. I spoke a little bit about radiation transport and light curves yesterday. So I'm gonna try to kind of put a bunch of those together uh, in discussions of compact object mergers and, and what we might learn uh, about them. There's two kind of compelling reasons why we want to study compact object uh, mergers. Uh, the first is that these are really strong gravitational wave sources. In fact, these are the sources that uh, advanced LIGO thinks it's going to detect in the next several years, hopefully. Uh, and then the, the second reason, maybe more relevant to this uh, workshop, is um, that there may be sites of uh, heavy, R pro uh, heavy element production, our process nucleosynthesis. And you'll actually be working on that uh, this afternoon in the uh, workshop using the torch network to, uh, you know, weigh in yourself onto what kind of nucleosynthesis you may get out of our process, uh, out of neutron star mergers. I'll try to give you some background to that. Uh, just for general background, right, if you look at the abundances of heavy elements, uh, this is in the solar system, you see kind of a wide range of processes going on, right? So yesterday you spent a lot of time working on uh, BBN code to understand nucleosynthesis in the lightest elements, and then the mass of stars and core collapse kind of fill in this range. The thermonuclear type 1a supernova give you most of the iron group. Uh, but then above the iron group, things are a little bit more uncertain, right? Where you make these heavy elements, we know it's through some kind of neutron capture, uh, occasionally slow ne neutron capture S process. That's understood pretty well. But uh, the site of the rapid neutron capture uh, elements, the R process, is still still uh, one of the big mysteries in nuclear astrophysics, right? Uh, and sometimes you can break these up into the heavier and lighter range of the R process. I'll kind of use the distinction strong R process or weak R process uh, to distinguish you know, stuff heavier than about barium or so. And if you look at uh, the abundances in, in stars, um, what you see is that you, you sometimes see variations in the amount of weak R process they have relative to strong R process. Whereas, as, as Young talked about yesterday, the, you know, within the strong R process, you know, the patterns are pretty stable, but uh, the relative amount in these two kind of groups may vary. So there's some indication from the, the abundance data in stars that maybe there's two sites of R process, or maybe there's uh, a single event that makes uh, R process in two different ways. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that as we go on. Okay. So, I mean, that we, we think we understand the nuclear physics of what's going on pretty well. You, uh, with our process, you basically all you need is to get some outflow that is um, heavily neutron rich uh, and has some other properties and entropy and, and so on. Uh, we'll use this designation Ye to describe how neutron rich something is. So this is Ye, the electron fraction, which is the same thing actually as the proton fraction. It's the number density of protons over the number density of nucleons. Uh, and so if we want this uh, outflow to be neutron rich, we want this quantity Ye to be less than uh, a half or so, right? And the lower it is, the easier it is to make heavy elements via the R process, the more neutrons you have. So, uh, you know, naturally there's two sites that people have long considered for, for making uh, R process that involve uh, neutron stars, since you have a lot of neutrons around. One is in core collapse supernova where you first form a neutron star, collapse the core into a proto-neutron star that's initially quite hot and it may blow off a, a wind driven by neutrinos uh, and produce some small mass of our process elements, maybe 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5 solar masses. Um, these events are, are, are really common, right? We see core collapse supernova going off all the time. We see their light curves, which are pretty bright and, and, and uh, easily observed. Um, the problem here is that people have been trying to model this uh, R-process nucleosynthesis in the proto-neutron star for many years, uh, and no one's really gotten it to work in a, in a detailed calculation. The, the outflows that you get from this proto-neutron star are just not neutron-rich enough. They don't have the right entropies to produce the R process. Now maybe there's some physics that's missing in this simulation that uh, one of you will figure out, but um, it's, it's people have gotten a little pessimistic about making the R process in this way. So there's a lot of attention turned to whether, whether you can make the R process in neutron star mergers, and here it's kind of the opposite story. 
uh, you can't but help make uh, heavy elements in these things. You take neutrons, two neutron stars, you kind of slam them together, and you fling out some very neutron rich material, and, and pretty robustly you get some R process mass, and, and actually a lot more than you would get in a supernova, maybe 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. Uh, now these mergers are, are quite rare events. They're maybe a hundred or a thousand times more rare than a uh, core collapse supernova. And it, they're optically quite dim, so we don't have, you know, observations of light curves and spectra of these events to sort of uh, analyze directly. So a lot of what we're talking about now is still based on simulation. But there is one really interesting thing that for the future of studying these events, and that is what I've kind of called here the R process purity. Here, a very low purity, that is you're making, you know, in a 10 solar mass star, you're making maybe, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 6 solar masses of R process. So it's kind of hopeless to look at that supernova and try to dig out uh, the R process elements from the spectra or something. But in these neutron star mergers, you eject mass that's almost pure R process. It's almost like nothing else that you can think of in the universe. You just get this pure cloud of, of very heavy elements coming out. And if we could see that, if we could observe uh, light curves and spectra of these events, it would probably tell us a lot about what's going on with the R process. And I'll, I'll try to um, show efforts to, to, to make the connections to, to observations in that way. So can neutron stars account for all of the R process uh, elements we see in the universe? I think you'll have talks next week about chemical enrichment uh, models and, and what's required. There's really two questions you have to answer is what, first, what are the rates of these mergers? How common are they? And we don't know the answer to that question. There's estimates of how common they are, but they're uncertain to, you know, a couple orders of magnitude. And that is because the system that gives you this is quite complicated. It was initially two massive stars. Each of them went core collapse supernova in their lifetime. And you wound up with some pair of neutron stars that over time will lose energy and angular momentum to gravitational wave emissions and eventually merge. But whether they merge in a reasonable amount of time or not depends on this separation distance, and that's hard to predict. So they have to be relatively close, maybe within a solar radius for them to merge within a Hubble time. Uh, and so, you know, we see these systems within our own galaxy, so you can try to estimate the rates uh, from that, but they're still quite uncertain uh, how common these things are. And that's one of the big questions, of course, for gravitational wave detection with LIGO. If, if these things happen to be very rare, we might not see them in gravitational waves with LIGO. If they happen to be very common, you might get tens or hundreds of them per year. So we'll, we'll have an answer to that question to some extent in a few years when the gravitational wave detectors start to turn on. Uh, the second question is, how much R process material do you make uh, in, in a merger? And I gave you kind of a rough number before, in 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. That's something that's based on simulations that I'll show you. Uh, and maybe eventually we're starting to touch on getting actually observational data that will be able to answer the question of how much uh, heavy elements you could actually make in a neutron star merger. So here's basically, you know, the pattern of events or simulations you'd have to do to, to model these. You know, first again, there's this binary stellar evolution that may last for millions or billions of years as these things spiral in. We won't talk much about that. Uh, but when they start to get very close together within, you know, a few neutron star radii of each other, uh, then they start to get tidally stripped apart uh, and, and coalesce. And so that's a, a dynamical simulation you have to run that's going to last uh, initially milliseconds, and then there may be some phase after that lasting seconds um, that you have to simulate to figure out what material gets flung out, if any, and also do some nuclear reaction network calculations to figure out what the abundances of those uh, material would be. And then after that material gets flung out, you'll get this cloud of heavy elements. It's almost like uh, nuclear waste. It's these just unstable nuclear elements. They're radioactive, and they'll glow radioactively for some time period afterwards, for days or so. And so we have a chance of seeing that glow, supernova-like glow, from the radioactive debris of a merger, 
And that's basically requires you to do a radiative transfer calculation like I talked about yesterday to, to model the light curves. And then we can predict some sort of spectrum um, that maybe we can observe. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit first about the, the simulations of the dynamics and then uh, talk about what we expect to see from the, uh, the light curves of these radioactive powered events. So there's been a lot of work trying to model the, sim, uh, the dynamics of mergers. I think you guys even did a workshop trying to mer merge two neutron stars yourself with Christian. Uh, here's one calculation I like to show by Stefan Roswag showing uh, the mergers of two neutron stars in a, in a SPH calculation. That is a smooth particle hydrodynamics um, calculation. There's a lot that goes into these simulations or that should go into these simulations. It's similar to trying to do a, a core collapse uh, model. You know, you have to include gravity. Um, ideally, you would do that in full general relativity. Uh, a lot of calculations, including this one, are, don't do full general relativity. They're doing some sort of Newtonian or pseudo-Newtonian um, gravity. Uh, you want to do the hydrodynamics. Here it's with particle uh, hydrodynamics. Others have been done grid-based. You need to say something about the equation of state of these neutron stars. We don't know the equation of state of nuclear matter um, yet, but people have come up with various models of that, and you can uh, run different simulations varying the equation of state to see what effect it has. Uh, magnetic fields and nuclear reactions can play a role in neutrino physics also. Um, uh, can be important, especially when you're considering the composition of this material since the weak interactions can, of course, exchange protons and neutrons. So there really haven't been simulations in 3D that, you know, capture all of this physics at once, you know. For example, the neutrinos, as I talked about, the transport problem is very difficult, so this is easily either not included in this calculation, it's not included, or it's treated with some approximate method, leakage method, or something like that. All right, so different Different calculations have done different parts of the physics, uh, better or worse. But this is a nice one uh, that shows you the two neutron stars. Now they're cut in half. He's only showing you the bottom half, so you can kind of peer into the center of it. And it's color-coded by this YE. So very low YEs, 0.1 and below. So this is very neutron-rich material, right? There's a whole, uh, yeah. yeah. The coloring is a bit different. Than the well, the, well, the, uh, yeah, yeah, so the crustal area has sort of a different electron fraction right. than the material in here. So that depends on, you know, your equation of state that you put in and then what YE comes out of it. Do you know the mass of it too? And these, I think, are equal mass uh, neutron stars, so each about 1.4 solar masses, which is kind of the standard neutron star mass that people often use. But people have done simulations varying the, the mass ratio. So we'll let these guys go, and you start to see them kind of get tidally distorted, and then they coalesce. Um, most of the mass winds up here in this central remnant, which uh, at least initially is some massive neutron star. Now if these are two 1.4 solar mass um, uh, uh, neutron stars, then this final remnant is going to be something almost close to three solar masses. And that may be above the ma maximum mass a neutron star can have. Uh, or at least a cold, non-rotating neutron star can have. So this central neutron star, it may live a little bit of time, but it's likely to collapse to a black hole after some period of time. And how long it can survive as a neutron star will depend upon, you know, what forces may be able to, to sustain it for a while. So if there's some strong differential rotation, uh, at least while that persists, uh, you may be able to, to maintain a neutron star. Uh, or if there's some thermal support or so on. So either on sort of a, a time scale for torques to, to, to uh, bring it into solid body rotation or for radiation of neutrinos to cool it off, uh, this will collapse uh, on time scales of, we're not sure, but maybe, you know, milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. Well, the Yeah, right. So, I mean, it de I'll show you some results from other groups as well. Uh, it depends upon various factors, so the mass ratio and so on. So it can be, but it's somewhere in the range of 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 2 solar masses. That's not very much. And that's a, this is a Newtonian calculation. 
Yeah. Well, what do you mean not very much? I mean, it's a, it's a lot in terms of our process production, right, compared to what you'd expect from a core collapse supernova. Well, it depends. We don't want the resource submergible. Right, exactly. Maybe not nearly enough. If, yeah, so I think if, if you imagine these eject like 10 to the minus 2 solar masses in general, and you take kind of a typical neutron star merger race I mean, in the middle of the guess range, then I think you can explain almost all the R process. But if the rate's on the low end, you can't do it. Um, or if the mass ejected is actually smaller than is predicted here. So it's like I said, that there's those two questions of the rates and the, the mass ejected. If we knew those, we would be able to answer the question of whether this can account for all the R process. Uh, as of yet, we don't necessarily know that answer, but uh, we're, getting, we're getting better. I'll play it again. Notice the time scale here. So this is just a few milliseconds orbital time. This whole simulation runs about 10 milliseconds. Uh, in addition to this massive neutron star, you see this material getting flung out. <coughs> this is tidal tail material that just, as George was saying, it just becomes unbound in the merger. The mass goes in the center and a little bit of material gets, gets uh, whipped out on the sides. Other simulations with GR show material getting sort of squeezed out as these things come together. Yeah? Uh, this part is a slight tangent. Uh, how come the electron fraction increases as you move towards the center of the star? Uh, you mean in this? Well, because you showed the, the electron fraction of course, but it's, right, it's right. like it's increasing as you go in to the star, which is surprising to me. Yeah, well, the density is increasing as you go in as well. So depending on your. Uh, equation of state, you're gonna, there's going to be some equilibrium ye there. Uh, actually, I don't know off the top of my head why it has that dependence, but it has to be do with your structure of your neutron star, your temperature density profile that you start out with. Um, so, Yeah, no, that's a good question. There's, there's some nuclear physics uh, explanation of that. So where are the heavy elements that serve as the key for neutron ejection in the arc that we're talking about? Is that in the structure? So I'll talk about that. So the stuff that's getting flung out here is going to be, you know, after it expands a little, it's going to be basically just nucleons, protons, and neutrons. And those will assemble all the way up through the R process. Uh, so I'll show, show a little flow chart of that in a second. Of, uh, Little thing. So, so we might have some material dynamically ejected. Uh, most of the mass is here, and then there's some mass in a disk around that gets hung up in a disk around there that will eventually accrete onto there. And on longer time scales, so this was time scales of milliseconds, but of time scales of seconds, you may actually blow off more material in this disk as it accretes. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So there may be two ways to eject material here. You know, promptly as the thing merges, you just fling it out. And then on longer time scales, uh, as stuff sinks into the central object. So here's a variety of different uh, cal calculations of the material that becomes unbound just dynamically, these tails that get flung out. This is from another SBH calculation. And now showing you differences for different neutron star mass ratios. So this is similar to the one I just showed you, equal mass ratio. You get kind of like a donut-y looking ejected material, you know, you get one tidal tail here, another tidal tail here. Uh, and here's a black hole merging with a neutron star. You only get one tidal tail from the neutron star, nothing from the black hole, so you get sort of this um, single tail kind of thing. So you get a variety of geometries and a variety of masses getting flung out in this dynamical phase. Here's a, a nice calculation by uh, Boswine, Gorilla, and Yanka showing um, a, a, a number of simulations where they calculated how much material got flung out. Uh, and they, they varied it and showed that, uh, you know, the amount, the amount that you get uh, ejected depends on this mass ratio, but it also depends upon the nuclear equation of state. So here's similar to what I showed you before, two equal mass neutron star mergers. Um, 
But this axis here is basically showing you the dependence on the equation of state, which has been parameterized as the uh, neutron star radius. As you change the uh, equation of state, you'll get a more compact or a more extended neutron star. So this is actually the Boswine group, the Yonkers group. So this is actually, a, well, it includes some GR, so it's conformally, it's not full GR, but it's a conformally flat treatment uh, with the hydrodynamics is done in, in SBH. So you already see it compared with the previous slide, you put in some numbers for the mass as well on the other one. Yeah. So this is uh, one thing that's been noticed. So uh, in, de in, in addition to depending on the these mass ratios and equation of state, um, it seems to depend upon the treatment of gravity. So this is from a Newtonian calculation. You see you get pretty high masses of ejecta. 5% of solar mass. 5% of the solar mass. In this calculation by a different group that included some GR, it's about 10 times less, yeah. And it's generally been seen that as people do it with GR that you get less material flung out. So and these things look nowhere what was the rate you were using again? 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the minus 5. So, uh, yeah, it, well, it depends upon that rate, I guess. You might have to go to a higher rate if you don't. I mean, you can think in terms of the, the core collapse supernova, right? It, if they're, they make 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5 solar masses, and these guys make 1,000 times more, the 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, uh, then you would just need the rate to be, you know, a thousand times less than, you know, even if the rate is a thousand times less than the core collapse rate, which is like, you know, several, you know, one per several decades, uh, then you'll be all right. So, it, it, yeah, I mean, the problem is the rates are uncertain by a couple orders of magnitude. So you take, so depending on where you are, uh, you can explain it or not. Uh, nearby stars is going to form from that area right. in, in the next generation. They're going to carry this huge amount of off-process material. Yeah. So a simple calculation will show you how much off-process material you expect to see that kind of star. Yeah. So we might ever find those kind of stars. Huh. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I hope you all get to talk about this next week when you talk about the chemical evolution. And people have looked into this about whether, you know, the, these things are... Uh, consistent with what you see in the galaxy. So as John was saying, these, if you have a very rare but very uh, a rich mass injection by neutron star mergers, then the enrichment of the galaxy you would think would be pretty patchy. You know, over here there's a ton of R process, over here there's none. And in stars you don't, you see a lot of variation in R process abundance, but not a, a ridiculously large. So whether that's consistent depends upon, you know, what you think the rate is and how you think material in the galaxy was mixed over its history and that kind of thing. So there's a very interesting sort of connection to, to the chemical enrichment stuff that you'll talk about uh, next week. Uh, in any case, the point here is, is that the, the amount of mass ejected uh, will depend upon the, the mass ratio of the two stars. It depends somewhat on the equation of state. So if you go to a more compact neutron stars, you tend to have a more violent merger. You eject more material. Uh, if you have a more uh, desperate mass ratio, in this case, you eject more material. So but it's somewhere in this range of maybe 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 solar masses uh, is where most of the simulations find. And as we've, we've seen, the, there's differences depending on who's doing the calculation and what physics they're treating. So this gets to Mike's question of, of how you actually build up the R process elements from this material. And uh, uh, you know what gets ejected is probably pure uh, nucleons to start with, neutrons and protons, and you know more neutrons than protons, right? We have a a low IE, and somehow that builds up to uh, 
to heavier elements. So Young already talked about this yesterday. We talked about his chest moves, so we can kind of make his chest moves. I'll just give you the kind of big flow chart of what will happen. So the first thing is this stuff expands and it cools, right? Eventually it'll cool to the point where neutrons and protons can recombine to alpha particles, which they like to do since that's a very stable particle. Uh, and once you've used up all the protons and put them into alpha particles, you'll still have some neutrons left, right? Because we started out with more neutrons than protons. And then as the temperature uh, drops a little bit more, you'll be able to uh, burn helium into heavier elements like carbon by triple alpha. Now this is kind of a rate limiting step since this is a three body interaction and it's pretty slow. So you're probably not going to be able to uh, burn all of your helium into carbon but some of it will go into carbon. Uh, there's other ways to, to make this transition, but they're, they all tend to be kind of slow. So after some period of time, you'll be wind up with some kind of carbon or heavier elements and helium. And then, of course, the helium can capture with the carbon and build up even heavier seeds up to iron or beyond. And so you'll wind up something with some amount of uh, these C, heavy C nuclei, some amount of helium left over that wasn't able to make it through this triple alpha process. Uh, and some amount of neutrons that are still sitting around. And this sets the stage now for the, for the actual R process, okay? And how, heavy, and how heavy an element you can finally build up will depend upon how many neutrons you have per seed. Yeah? So do you get some C nuclei from nuclear fusion or fusion or fusion or the material that's ejected, I think it stays in NSC for a while, but I think that NSC, you know, it's very hot. Uh, high density stuff predicts you have sort of free nucleons. And then you go through these processes here, and then, you know, at this step, um, you know, you're no longer in, in NSC. And so it depends upon the actual reaction rates, how much heavier elements you produce. The interesting thing is about this, because the initial C composition of some matter is extremely neutron. And its own energy prefers some awfully neutron nuclear, which is violently decays very quickly. So that energy actually heats it up. That's the why what the Jan was talking about is it heats up back into the neutron to proton energy, neutron to proton energy. So initially you do get some cold heat of the awfully neutron which is good nuclear. But it builds up and very unstable. And then the decay energy releases that energy. That's actually a yeah, yeah, so you start out in the neutron star crust, you have these kind of heavy nuclei or nuclear pasta and all this kind of stuff, but then pretty, <coughs> pretty soon afterwards, you're gonna just disintegrate that stuff into neutrons and protons, and then you build your way back up. I don't think any of that initial stuff survives. Oh, I thought that because, well, then now you have a very large neutron crust with as light as that reaction. They also have an energy to fill in now. Yeah, so the other, uh, the other uh, reaction, yeah, is, is what Young said, alpha, alpha, and so that can be more important, actually, than, than triple alpha. Uh, but it still is, you know, a, kind of a, a limiting step in the fact that it's a three-body sort of. Is there another question? Yeah. No, okay. So, okay, so anyways, you, you wind up with seed, so it depends on this sort of nuclear physics. Then you start capturing the neutrons on the seed, and so you build up into heavier neutron-rich isotopes. Uh, so you step this way, and then those can beta decay down. So you kind of build up even heavier by sneaking the particles in as, as neutrons and letting them decay to protons, right? And so you'll wind up with some high Z elements. So, you know, what abundance you have will depend upon sort of your initial YE. Uh, and it also depends on things like the entropy, because that describe, you know, determines how much of this helium will eventually wind up in seeds and, and so forth. Okay, so here's a picture. You might have seen a movie like this of the R process. Um, Jen is showing how it works in the table, of the chart of the nuclei. So this is all the nuclei, nuclei, the number of neutrons, the number of protons, and then these are, of course, the stable nuclei we know. And so what the R process does is starting here with some seed, you can build up by neutron capture, you know, stepping this way and then beta decaying down uh, heavier elements. And then this, this is what the... Um, movie shows for this example. You kind of quickly build up heavier elements by neutron capture. You have sort of a piling up of material at these magic numbers where you have particularly stable nuclei. And now you see them uh, beta decaying down through this diagonal chest step down, back down to stability. Yeah? It's hard, it's hard to read. What, what, what mass was the seed at initially? What A and B? I think it was an iron. 
uh, maybe it was a nickel seed, uh, and I'm not sure why they started there. So what you seed you start with depends upon your conditions, is that process I just described. And uh, also where you run on the curve here depends upon how many neutrons you have. So if you're very neutron rich, as you are in some of these neutron star mergers, you can actually capture all the way here and, and move you know, closer to this drip line. This was one that was a little less neutron rich, so it, the path moved here, but you can move sort of anywhere along this curve, uh, depending on where you start out, uh, what your initial conditions are. And notice the time scales here too, here's the time. So it just takes you know, a second or so to build up these heavy elements. Um, and then they beta decay down on some longer time scale. So it's still taking seconds to beta decay down. In fact, this decay can last for uh, tens of seconds, minutes, hours, days. So that's the, this is basically the radioactive nuclear waste I was talking about. It's, it's remaining radioactive for, for days and weeks afterwards. And that's what we may be able to see as we, uh, if we look out uh, in the sky. Yeah? And the pattern of kind of abundantly populated space, that's pretty impressive, correct? Well, if you, so if you're very neutron rich and you can build up to these heaviest elements, then you'll start to fission and you'll ha have fragments that sort of rain down back into lighter nuclei and then those can build up. And so fission cycling is the process of sort of doing that over and over again and, and giving you some pattern. So in these neutron star, this is not necessarily for a neutron star merger case. This is just a parameterized uh, initial conditions. But if you're very neutron rich, you can do that fission cycling. Uh, even if you're not very neutron rich, you might not do much fissioning, but you'll still get some pattern of nuclei that, you know, you know, these building up of peaks, right, yeah. is a factor of these, uh, these magic numbers, these, um, these very stable closed shells where nuclei tend to just pile up in the flow. So you can think of it as sort of, you know, as, as, as the nuclei flow here, there's sort of these uh, slow decay rates that are kind of like bottlenecks in traffic where, where the cars pile up, and that's why you get peaks in your abundance distribution because everything moves slowly there and, and the nuclei all pile up there. So this is the kind of abundance pattern that you get in one of these simulations. This is from Gorelli and the Yonka group um, for material that would be dynamically eject ejected from a neutron star merger, so it is quite neutron rich. Uh, and you'll be able to do simulation, you know, nu nuclear reaction calculations like this with Torch if you want this afternoon. Uh, and so you can see here the abundance pattern matches the solar for these simulations quite quite well in this range, the, the, the heavy, or what I call the strong R process. Uh, so you make all these heavy elements. Uh, it doesn't match quite so well in the, in the weak R process. So you basically make only uh, heavy elements. And you would need some other site to explain the, the light range of R process. Okay? But it's pretty robust. You, know, you change neutron star masses, or different people have done this calculation with different reaction networks. And you you always seem to get this strong R process. You can't help it because you start out with so many neutrons, they just all build up at the heavy elements. So does that calculation include um, neutrino and also outflow rate? There's no neutrino transport, as far as I know on this. It's just material that got dynamically ejected. Uh, in starting, it's basically the YE that it started out with so in the neutron star. Taken out Yes, yeah. Now there's been some papers more recently where they've claimed to put in some neutri neutrinos and that the irradiation of the, the stuff as it flies out by neutrinos in the interaction region can change the YE and, and maybe give you a lower YE or higher YE that would maybe fill up this region. So I think it's still, I don't think anyone's done the full calculation with neutrino transport in there um, to, to say how important those neutrinos might be. But if, but if you don't include it and you just Assume the YE is fixed from what the neutron star is. You get this. Uh, you get this heavy stuff. So yeah, more work needs to be done to to include the effects of neutrinos. Uh, yeah, and so again, over time, we just saw in that that uh, movie that this stuff beta decays back down to equilibrium over periods of uh, days or weeks. Here's sort of the heating rate calculated, which will depend upon you know, how neutron rich the material is. Here's some of the isotopes that you produce that tend to beta decay on long time scales. So 
So we have some sort of uh, radioactive cloud that gets ejected. Here's my radioactive cloud. And this radioactive cloud will expand and grow to very large sizes, maybe the size of the solar system, become very diffuse, as we talked about yesterday, and photons will eventually be able to leak out of it, and you'll be able to see um, uh, light curves. And, and this kind of event has been termed a kilonova because it's not quite uh, as bright as a supernova, but it's much brighter, maybe a thousand times brighter than a nova. So people give it the terminology a kilonova uh, as a possible um, signature. And how bright these things will be, so basically the radioactive uh, energy will be deposited and heat this cloud, which will then emit thermally. The luminosity will depend upon how much radioactivity there is and what its heating rate is. So this kind of plot here is, tells you how much energy you're dumping in from radioactivity. And how, how long that uh, light curve lasts will depend upon how long it takes photons to diffuse out of this cloud. So we derived this uh, diffusion time uh, in the lecture yesterday. So it'll depend upon how much mass is in this cloud and also what the opacity of that cloud is. And that raises an interesting question. What's the opacity of this material? Like I said, it's unlike anything else you really come across in astrophysics. It's almost pure heavy elements, a cloud of pure um, heavy stuff. So, but basically you can do a transport simulation, follow photons through here. So I'm <coughs> doing simulations uh, in, a, in a Monte Carlo method, basically following individual photons as they scatter and diffuse through this um, cloud. Uh, what do you expect the opacity to be? So here I showed this uh, last time what some of the opacities are for a supernova-like material. Uh, this would be for solar composition, so it's not quite applicable to what we're talking about now, but it shows you the basic idea that you have electron scattering, and then you have all these lines that tend to dominate. Um, they all blend together and produce this continuum that tends to dominate the total opacity. And so you can do a calculation of what you'd expect the kilonova light curve to look like, this radioactive transient from the, from the debris of the neutron star merger. Uh, and, and here's the calculation done, uh, assuming the opacity of this material is similar to what we have in a, a supernova, like a type 1a supernova, so maybe dominated by all those iron lines. Uh, and you can see you get this kind of dim, brief transient. For comparison, I plotted a normal supernova light curve here, which is about 10 to the 43 ergs per second. These kind of kilonova would be maybe 100 times, as bright, uh, 100 times less bright uh, and last only, you know, a few days or so. And that's really just because the masses involved are much less, right? A typical supernova have a solar mass or tens of solar masses. Here we only have maybe 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. So there's a lot less radioactivity to power something bright, and the time scale to diffuse out of that is, is much less since the mass is much smaller, okay? But the really key question here is, is, you know, this calculation assumed an opacity that was kind of similar to what we understood from, from regular supernova. And as I said, the composition here is, is quite different. So we have to look a little more detail as to what the opacity might be like. Um, and in a supernova, the opacity is really dominated by lines. So if you think of a photon moving through this expanding supernova cloud, uh, it's constantly being redshifted with respect to the co-moving frame. So its co-moving wavelength is moving to the red. So as it moves in space, it's also moving in wavelength to the, to the red. And that means it's going to move and hit some line here, come into resonance with it, scatter around, maybe get past that, move to the next, and, and scatter through the line. And so the, the kind of the mean free path that this photon experiences depends upon how many lines you have how far you can go before you hit the next line. Uh, less so on how strong the individual lines actually are, okay? So the analogy is if you go out into the, to the forest and you close your eyes and you just start running, what you'll find is your mean free path is set by the density of trees, how many trees there are. It doesn't matter really how high the trees are, it just depends how many trees are there before you start bouncing in your painful random walk through the forest. So, so here, the, the opacity we see is going to depend uh, really how many lines there are 
And that raises an interesting point because we can kind of estimate what the opacity would be by just kind of estimating how many lines there will be in, in certain elements. And that gets us to an issue of atomic complexity, that is how complex is an atom, how many levels and line transitions does it have? And the answer is already laid out for us on the periodic table, right, as you learned in uh, you know, quantum mechanics, right? The periodic table gives you, uh, lays things out in the orbital electron shell. So for example, these elements here, right, the electrons are in the, the S shell, L equals zero shell, right? So you can only have two different, uh, you can only fit two electrons in that shell, right? Spin up, spin down. These are very simple elements. They only have a certain amount of different levels that you can create by moving things spin up or spin down. Over in this region, we have the p-shell elements, right? They're in an L equals one angular momentum uh, shell. So these are more uh, complicated. You can have, you know, L equals one, or M equals one, M equals zero, M equals minus one, and two spins. So there's a lot of different ways of arranging the electrons in these p-shells. You get somewhat more complex atoms, more lines. And then the d-shell is even more complex, right? There's even more elements, uh, uh, even more uh, spaces in the, uh, in, the, in the valence shell. And so this is why iron is one of the uh, more complicated atoms that you see in astrophysics. It's, you know, it's right in the middle of the D shell. It's quite a complex atom. And what's different really about these uh, neutron star merger material is that unlike most things in astrophysics, you can produce a lot of these guys. With lanthanides in particular, you can have a, a heavy abundance of those. And these are now in the F shell, they're even more complicated. Uh, there's even more ways of arranging electrons in those valence shells. And so they'll have even more levels and even more line transitions. So this is kind of a plot that's just showing you that complexity. You can roughly estimate how complex an atom is by just asking, what's the number of ways I can put my n electrons into g spaces in the, in the valence shell, right? It's just a, common, a combinatorics kind of question. And so here you see the pattern of, you know, s is quite simple, p a little bit more complex, and the lanthanides here, which have an F shell, are the most complex, right? And so sort of the, a rough estimate of the number of levels is the number of ways you put these electrons in. It's an order of magnitude higher for the lanthanides than it is for something like iron, just because of the atomic physics. Uh, the number of lines will probably go something like the number of levels squared, right? They're the number of different transitions you can have between all those levels. So naively, you would think the opacity of this lanthanide material can be sort of 100 times greater than uh, the iron, just based on simple kind of atomic physics arguments. And interesting, that this transition is kind of roughly between the weak and in the R, uh, strong R process, whether you get these elements or you don't. So wh what you do with your nucleosynthesis is going to have a big impact on what you do to your light curve, because it's going to affect the, the opacity strongly. So that's kind of the general argument. To do it in more detail, you need to run uh, you know, detailed atomic structure models to try to model all these levels of the lines. So we, uh, we did that uh, using this auto structure code. Here's just an example of the level energy structure to give you a feel for what I was just talking about. You're familiar with hydrogen, right? It's got a few levels. It's a pretty simple uh, atom. It's a S shell atom. If you go to silicon, that's in the P shell. OK, now it's a little more complex. We have more levels, more lines. If you go to iron, I showed it yesterday, right? It's even more complex. There's a lot of different levels closely spaced. There's a lot of lines. Uh, and then if we go to a lanthanide, an F-shell element like neodymium, um, it's yeah, basically op opaque even in this figure. The lines are so close together that uh, it's a very dense forest. And so you can just kind of visualize how opaque it is for photons to try to move their way through when they can only move sort of line to line before scattering. So that has a huge impact on the opacity. Here's calculations we did of the opacity of uh, different materials as a function of wavelength. This was for iron. Uh, and here's a lanthanide like neodymium or cerium. And you can see the opacity is 100 or 1,000 times larger just for these atomic physics reasons I just explained. So that has a pretty big impact on what we expect to see, and this is where some interesting things uh, appear. Before, before I did a calculation of the light curve assuming that it was sort of like iron group elements and the opacity was rather low and we saw it peaked at, you know, in about a day or so. 
Uh, but if we have a, a strong R process that's producing material with A greater than 130 that includes these lanthanide elements, then you have all that dense forest of lines, the opacity is much higher, uh, and the light curve uh, is quite a bit longer. So it takes just that much longer for the photons to diffuse out of the ejecta. It has an even more dramatic effect on the, the spectral energy distribution. Uh, if you're lanthanide free, so you have kind of lower mass elements, you get something that peaks kind of in the optical. But when you have this really high opacity, it kind of, uh, the light curve takes longer and the photosphere moves outwards and you wind up with a much cooler uh, infrared sort of emission. And so this has pretty big impacts for what you should go out and look for when you want to try to find one of these kilonova. If it is strong R process and includes the lanthanides, it should be mostly a red um, uh, infrared kind of uh, event. If it's a uh, lanthanide free, it'll be more optical. And so this gives us some diagnostics of actually what happened in the nucleosynthesis, how, how heavy an elements you actually produced, just based on the color of the kilonova that you observe. Uh, this is just kind of demonstrating the light curves in different bands, the infrared quite bright, the optical uh, highly suppressed because you have all those lines um, from the lanthanides. So there was one kind of tantalizing observation um, that we may be seeing just what I talked about, uh, the kilonova or radioactive emission from a neutron star merger. Uh, and that was related to this GRB that went off about a year ago now. Uh, these short gamma ray bursts are thought to be neutron star mergers, although uh, uh, it's something that's still debated occasionally. Um, so this was a GRB that went off relatively nearby um, in terms of short GRBs, but still pretty far away uh, at a redshift of about 0.35. Uh, and so after the GRB went off, it was sort of a trigger that maybe a neutron star merger had gone off there. And so observers followed this up with HST with deep infrared imaging. And here's the data they got. Here's the location of the GRB. Uh, in the optical, they didn't see anything. This is sort of Bef uh, this is before and this is after, uh, but in the infrared they saw sort of this intriguing glow. And so here's a, a more detailed plot of their data, what they observed. Uh, here's the optical band. They saw sort of a optical emission. This is from the gamma ray burst, uh, the afterglow from the gamma ray burst, and it just kind of falls off with the power law. Uh, in the infrared, they saw what's probably an afterglow as well, but if you kind of extrapolate this down, then the afterglow in the infrared should be something here, and this bright spot I just showed you in the infrared uh, was somewhere around here, so much brighter than you would naively expect any sort of afterglow to be. Um, but right in the range of what you'd expect a, a kilonova emission to, to be at, okay? So it's only one data point, but it's a data point that kind of lies in the range that we think this radioactive emission. So it could be the first you know, discovery of this radioactive material, and it would be sort of the first direct um, indication that uh, we've made our process in the, uh, in the neutron star merger. Um, moreover, you can compare that data point to models of, uh, you know, models that we've done of the light curves of these sort of tidal tail material and, and estimate the mass that uh, would have to be ejected to account for that. So again, there's only one data point on this light curve, but if you use that one data point and try to fit it to some model, and this is this 3D model shown as a function of viewing angle, then we get an ejected mass of something about 0.026 solar masses, which is you know, on the high side, but kind of in the range we thought might occur uh, for these neutron star mergers. Yeah, so this curve here is a 10 to the minus 1 light curve, 10 to the minus 1 solar mass light curve is 10 to the minus 2 solar mass. Okay, so you're, you're and you're somewhere in between. Like the square root of the two, basically. Yeah, so you're somewhere in between. Um, this, these were 1D models, and this actually includes the viewing angle effect, which is a factor of a couple, you know, maybe two or so. So uh, this number you shouldn't take too seriously. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a rough estimate because there's still uncertainties on 
on the details of what this geometry looks like and what these opacities are, but it's, it's kind of giving you a hint of what, if this is what, you know, one of these radioactive kilonova, this is kind of the range of mass you'd expect. Uh, of course, what we'd really like to get is, is, is follow up another one of these GRBs and get a lot, get a lot of data along this light curve uh, and even more kind of color information. This is one data point is not uh, as compelling as seeing a full rise and fall of the light curve, but. Right. The other one is uh, how fast the things go down. That's the time scale for the. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So as you change the mass, you make it brighter. You tend to make it somewhat broader too. Exactly. Other questions. Okay. I have a few minutes. I'm running a little late, but I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about how um, you might also make some more material, our process material, in the neutron star merger. The stuff I talked about so far was just material that get gets flung out as the thing comes together. Um, but after the phase, right, I said you wind up with a configuration where you have here most of the mass in this remnant, which is maybe initially a massive neutron star that collapses to a black hole. Uh, but some material gets hung up in a disk around it, depending on the angular momentum it has. You might have 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 1 solar mass of material in this disk that will accrete onto this central object. Okay. Now the orbital time scale again of this stuff going around the central object is just milliseconds. And that was kind of the time scale of that Roswag simulation I showed you of the merger. But the time scale for this to uh, actually accrete onto the central object is much longer. As accretion happens due to viscous effects, you can imagine this thing spinning around, it's in differential rotation. So it, you know, different shells are sliding against each other. There's some friction or some viscosity associated with that differential rotation, which over some period of time, you know, turns that, uh, uh, that kinetic energy into, into some heat, dissipates that energy, and transports angular momentum, so it kind of slows down these inner layers that fall in and pushes these outer layers out. And so that time scale for this, this thing to viscously uh, accrete is, is much longer. It's maybe a, a time scale of seconds. So you have to do another simulation now if you want to follow what happens after the merger, the uh, called the post-merger or longer-term evolution, follow the viscous evolution of this disk on a period of seconds or so. And what you'll find is a, a lot of the material may get, uh, you know, swallowed by the black hole, uh, but some of it will get driven out, either because as this friction, this viscosity operating heats it up, it gets uh, unbound and blows itself off, or maybe because neutrinos that are radiating blow some material off. Uh, you can also have nuclear reactions. You can have neutrons and protons going together as to alpha particles. Um, so you may, may uh, blow some material off. Meanwhile, you're getting irradiated by neutrinos over this longer time scale of a second. If there's a neutron star here, it's a very powerful source of neutrinos. If it's a black hole, you'll get a much weaker neutrino luminosity, but there'll still be some neutrinos uh, ejected, you know, emitted in the disk itself. And so interactions like this, of course, can change the YE of the disk. Uh, in fact, the neutrinos will tend to raise the YE of the disk because you have roughly equal numbers of electron uh, and anti-electron neutrinos. So you'll, you'll go to a more symmetric situation with closer uh, neutron and proton ratios. So this is work uh, is done by several people. Uh, Rodrigo Fernandez, a postdoc at Berkeley, has been doing a lot of these calculations. This is a 2D simulation now of the longer term evolution, so over a period of a few seconds, um, of this disk as it accretes onto the black hole. Uh, in this case, it's a black hole. This is a 2D calculation. You see here the material sort of being swallowed in, but also blown out. And here's the YE over here. Uh, this doesn't have a full neutrino transport. It just has a leakage scheme. But the neutrinos are quite important for setting this, this YE. Uh, here, the, here the YE is uh, something around 0.2 or so, so still quite, quite low. Um, if you have a neutron star here, though, at the center, it radiates a lot more neutrinos. So here's showing the density in a, when you have a neutron star. Here's showing the neutrino irradiation, largest in this polar region, and it's kind of obscured in this region since there's a high optical depth. So you get very high neutrino irradiation. 
and you get much higher electron fractions, you know, maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.3 here. Compared to the case where you have a black hole, you have much weaker neutrino irradiation and much lower YEs, okay? So the idea here is if, if a neutron star can survive for some period of time, it can irradiate this disk and raise its YE, and that will change the, uh, the final abundance pattern. So for example, here's one final uh, profile, the, the wind that gets ejected uh, from this disk for a neutron star that lives 30 milliseconds. Uh, here you have sort of a kind of dense core in this lower density halo, and here's the YE. So initially, when the uh, neutron star was alive, it irradiated this disk wind and it raised the YE to about 0.4 or so. Then the neutron star died and the wind went to a much lower YE when the neutrino radiation went away. So you get sort of a region of, of uh, low YE where you'll get strong R process and a, and a region of higher YE where you may get weaker R process. Here's the uh, YE of material ejected, uh, the distribution for different runs, assuming the neutron star lives various amount of time. So the blue here is if you just have a prompt formation of black hole, most of the YE is quite low. But if the neutron star lives for some period of time and irradiates the material, you can raise its YE quite a bit um, above, say, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. If you have a neutron star that lives forever, it can raise this all the way up to 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So the lifetime of the neutron star has a big impact on the YE of the material that gets ejected and will have a big impact upon the nucleosynthesis. So this is something you can explore this afternoon in your workshop, just say, run this torch network, change the YE, and what different abundances do you get out? These are calculations that we've done with torch. So if you have a low YE like 0.2, uh, you build all the way up to very heavy elements. The lower YE, you start to uh, stop at some A. Lower YE, you fill up the weaker, right? And this dash line here is kind of showing you this critical point where you start to make lanthanides and you change the opacities, uh, and below that you don't. And we saw that whether you had that high opacity lanthanides or not had a big impact on the, what you see, whether it's blue or red. So if you're kind of here, you expect to see high opacity, something very red. If you're somewhere here, you'll see a light curve that's low opacity, something blue. So we have kind of a very strong observational diagnostic of whether the nucleosynthesis went past here or not. Here's just showing you the same thing in, in a different way, showing you as the electron fraction changes, what kind of, how much what lanthanides you get. And sort of around Y is about 2.25, we find sort of a cutoff in, in producing heavy R process. So now here's the light curve uh, from uh, this other component of R process that you may get from a disk wind. It actually had a mixture of high YE and low YE, so we got sort of a short blue transient and then a longer termed infrared transient. And you see that in the spectra as well. You see like at early times you see a very blue uh, material. That's from the, the high YE stuff that was uh, low opacity. Uh, and then later times you see this infrared emission. So you kind of have a diagnostic actually in this predicted light curves and spectra of, of how much of each component of material you got and also a diagnostic in, in principle about how long this neutron star lasted before it collapsed to a black hole. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up, but the, the idea here is that there's, you know, there's quite an interesting future here. You know, in a few years, they'll start making detections, hopefully, with LIGO. Uh, LIGO will be able to tell you that some neutron star merger or compact object merger happened. It won't be able to localize it very well, so it'll say something happened kind of in this area of the sky with some big uncertainty, maybe 100 square degrees. And then observers want to go off and, and look in that air box and try to find this radioactive kilonova that we've just been simulating. And if they can find it, it'll tell us something about the gravitational wave source, but it'll also tell us something about the R process, how much R process was made and, and how heavy the R process was, whether it went past the lanthanides or not. So these kind of simulations will be key to, to kind of designing the facilities you would need to try to find the, the transient associated with this. Should you look in the red? Should you look in the blue? Uh, well, it'll depend upon what gets ejected in the material. 
Um, but hopefully there's a lot of you know, observational teams trying to build surveys um, you know, kind of based on these simulations that will uh, be able to follow up these big error boxes and find the, the kilonova associated with it. And it has this, you know, an, uh, a chance to maybe get a better handle on whether these neutron star mergers are really contributing to the R process. Again, the, the key two unknowns were what the rate of these mergers are and how much material they, um, they uh, eject. And so it, with advanced LIGO, if it detects these things, we'll have a pretty good handle on the, the merger rate. I mean, it'll see everything within a certain volume. You can just count up how many mergers are going off. And if we can find the kilonova associated with it and fit it to the kind of models I showed you, we can actually estimate the mass ejected and even go further and estimate the kind of composition ejected, whether at least whether it's heavy R process or, or lighter R process. And so you put those two things together, you just sort of count up the gold in the, in the universe. You count up all these heavy elements and you'll have sort of a observationally motivated estimate of, of how much these uh, um, these events contribute to heavy element production. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, though, uh, on the simulations and the dynamical calculations, right, including GR, realistic equation of states, and the neutrino physics that's been done only very simply so far. And we saw that has a big impact on the, the um, composition. And then, of course, on the photon transport to predict these light curves, these opacities are still quite uncertain. We need more work to, to figure those out. But there's a lot of interesting things to, to do here going forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And other questions? Yeah. I just wanted to maybe comment on the effect of masses. A month ago, I think it came out by Sean Fluff to talk that Sean has just done black hole neutron star merger simulations with full CR. And he reported the effect of masses of at least several percent, like to 10 or 15. That's great, but the That's merger true. rate for black hole neutron stars is much lower. That's true. <laughs> well, we don't really know what the merger rate of black hole It's assumed to be much lower, but I think there's even less information on <laughs> black hole neutron star mergers than neutron star. We at least have a few examples of neutron star neutron star binaries that will merge. But you're probably right that they're, they're much rarer. Hans said that the Greer Brown would like to rely on that, but he always claimed that it was the binary that generates power out of the black hole. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, one game you can play is to say that the rate of production of these binary systems was much higher in the past. So that the, you know, what you're inferring now for the, you know, merger rate just from the few right. half dozen binary pulsars we know about is kind of off. Right? right. So the effective rate is much higher. Is that? Hmm? That's okay. But then we huh. might end up in a situation, how do you explain the continuous enrichment of the upper The continued what? Continued enrichment of the upper like throughout the year. You're saying it doesn't match the time scale. Yeah, yeah you, you needed a whole history to come up right. <laughs> yeah. And why would the merger rate be larger in the past? I mean, the information was higher in the past. Mm -hmm. IMF might have been different very early on. Yeah. The, the delay is not too much of an issue. It's always a statistic. How many individual systems will end up in this category? So suppose you, you are able to form more massive stars in the early Hibon, right? And delay is only going to stop you, let's say, one billion years Other questions? Yeah. I think Mike and you covered by earlier the secret to this notion of weak R process versus strong R process. Is it thought that these are two different sites, two different mechanisms, or is there kind of a continuum well, between these two? Uh, maybe Yong could speak to that. I mean, it, you know, we kind of showed that within the one system of neutron star mergers, you can get a a range of, of different, uh, you can get both weak and strong. So maybe the, the initial dynamical ejecta that gets flung out is strong R process, but then this stuff that comes later from these disk winds is, is weak R process. And the relative abundance of the, you know, relative masses that get ejected in each of those can vary from case to case depending upon the, the details. And so there would be not necessarily a reason that they would track each other so closely. Um, but I don't know from the from the data if there's some deeper in just my ignorance, but some of the models. Right, right. It isn't the R process the weaker across the whole range kind of universal? No, 
No, it's only above the barrier mark. Just yeah. above, above just the barrier. Yeah, that's exactly what I understand. Yeah. 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 There's two loops that are about 30, and there's yeah. another loop. It's only, but it then why do you call it HD strong? Uh, that's it's why. That really is some kind of a, how do I say, when you make a conversation, you want to report something, everybody can refer <laughs> to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really it's just giving it a name. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There are even weirder names I don't want to mention, but it's a pretty <laughs> weird uh, You think about it, a nuclear system is a nuclear system. Whatever mechanism you end up operating with a piece of wood with, that's how it's made. So it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, uh, I say that the, the nucleus is there for you to see. Now, how you can then link it to the initial conditions you end up with, that's the thing we are really talking about. So the first, whatever weak or, or strong you call it, ultimately go back to the green number electron fraction, the entropy, and the dynamic time scale for each proton. If you know what the three combinations are like, you know that where you're going to end up. So the, whatever the weak part of the region corresponds to a domain of the atomic space, which will only end up there, whereas if you change to a different domain, then you end up in, in this other, other area. So that's the way to think about it. The population is what I have to do to get there. And then the astrophysical environment will tell you this is a YE, this is kind of scale <laughs> range that I'm going to give you. So the weak is family dependent and the strong is kind of destination. Uh, no, not really. It's, it's, it's again, it's just, how do I say it? Uh, if you go back to the what uh, Dan went through with the, the, the process, you initially have neutrons and protons, then you get a, some kind of e-nuclei, and then you have a remaining neutrons left over. Then you have a contract. How many neutrons is available for each of these three nucleus to capture? So let's say make it easy. The T nucleus is the mass number 60. And you have 100 neutrons per T, you're going to average end up at 160. If you only have 50 neutrons per T, you're going to only end up at 110. So that's the kind of a situation we're looking at. Whatever the initial parameter space is telling you how many neutrons will be available for each of the T nucleus you made to capture. And if it's the sum rule that ends up giving you the, the, the thing you expect, then you're going to get there. So this is Any other questions for, for Dan? All right, maybe we ought to move on. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dan.